Um, professor um, uh, Ben Pura is a professor at the uh, Department of Politics and Government here at Ben Gurion University. He's the author of a number of books um, which deal with the topics of politics and governments, particularly among Israel. His research has uh, touched on a number of topics between religious uh, extremism, uh, policy, uh, related cross-examining it with other cultures, Ireland, Italy, Turkey. Um, his latest research has talked about the great the, the rift. Um, we'll hear about this in this uh, presentation shortly. Um, the two upper opposite polar um, trends that are happening in the current Israeli society uh, drive to secularism, drive to religious resurgence among certain populations, and how that um, plays out in terms of policy. Um, I asked myself which came first, politics or religion, uh, or were they sort of worn out together? And uh, I'd like to call attention to one of Professor uh, Ben's works, the separation between synagogue and state. Uh, I think the past few months before prior to October 7, Israeli society was dealing with this issue um, on, a, on a level that has never been on a social activist level. Um, where are we going? How are we going to get there? And hopefully this lecture will clarify some of the processes or the multi-processes that are going on in current Israeli um, society. So with uh, further mentioning the list of publications and awards, <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, between secularization, relig uh, religious resurgence, Israel in the populist age. So, uh, so um, when I teach students the uh, well, first or second year of teaching, so it's more of a sounded song to words. Do you think that some talk, when you talk about this course, is these two words? Uh, what is the Jewish state? What is the democratic state? Can these two combine? And I think this is all about image, relations, so it kind of sums up. And I think there are, there are three major challenges. One is the occupation. Uh, can Israel maintain democracy in the occupation? The other is the Arab minority. Can Israel provide uh, the minority in Israel equal rights as a democracy? Can we see this Jewish state? And these two issues are not part of this, the talk today. And I think the, one of the other topics is Jewish pluralism. Can uh, Jewish state be also pluralistic and democratic in the sense of a liberal state. And uh, let me take you to two images that I think uh, kind of sums up my, my recent thoughts. This is a year ago, but seems like many years ago. I think this image to a large extent is about fears, about many Israeli liberal fears. This image of the, uh, the handmaid's tale that Israel is turning into a non-democratic, non-pluralistic, non-liberal state, or maybe it already is at that stage. And the, the recent government, or the current government actually, or recent is, uh, thoughts maybe, uh, wishful thinking, kind of uh, brought these fears to the fore. So uh, this is the one image I want you to keep in mind. Well, and the, the second image is more recent. This is actually two days ago of the, uh, of the, the convention being in Binei Uma, which is about returning to, uh, to Bush Katif, the idea that uh, the war in Gaza must end with Israel's return of uh, settlement in Bush Katif. And what is interesting is the people that are on the stage. You have the, uh, the right, the religious right, the extreme right, and the ultra Muslim. So that's, a, that's a combination that I think kind of captures the fears on the previous uh, image. So that's just for the beginning. So 
I'm not sure how many of you are, uh, I'm sure everybody knows, so I'll go through this briefly. When we talk about, about uh, Israel's division of labor between religion and politics, we go back to pre statehood period, to the status quo. There was a letter that was sent by Ben Gurion to Rabbi Israel, in which Ben Gurion uh, actually promises that Rabbi Israel, the Israel, Orthodox, that in the future state, uh, a Jewish character will be maintained. And he gives some kind of details about marriage and divorce and about truth laws and about Sabbath, etc. And, and there's always a question of why did Ben Gurion uh, accede to these demands? What was the, what made Ben Gurion uh, concede to demands of the Orthodox? Considering the fact that the Labour Party was so dominant and it had so much power, so why did it need to uh, to, to to concede to these demands? And there are several explanations that uh, that that to come about, and I think some of them are actually important for the rest of this. I have trouble sitting and talking at the same oh, time, right. but uh, yeah. this is this. Okay, so, 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 so I, I will go back to, to history for, for those that, that don't know it. It's a letter sent by Ben Gurion to the Ultra Orthodox in 1947, before the UN Commission comes to Israel to determine the future borders of the state. And Ben Gurion is concerned that the Ultra Orthodox will not play along. So, this letter is a letter of promise to them. If you will play along with us, here's our promise. It will be a Jewish state, which will have a, it's a, it's, 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 it's vague promises for uh, marriage, divorce, et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of a, a, a stepping stone in what comes ahead. And so why did the Gurion agree to, to, to these demands? And there are several, several examples, several uh, explanations that don't rule out each other. What is necessity, political necessity? Ben Gurion was a pragmatist. There is a, a priority here, and we are now building a state, and there is a war going on, and we don't think conflicts within us, and so we make this compromise in order to proceed to the more important things. Uh, another is the quest for unity. So we want to speak for the Jewish people. We want to keep them under the same roof, and we need to compromise. But I think there are two more issues that that, that we need to consider. One is what I defined as ambivalence among the seculars. So we're building here a Jewish state, and we have no idea what Jewish means, actually. So the Orthodox might have an answer for us. So when we look for an answer, what is a Jewish state? How do you conduct Jewish rituals? We turn to the Orthodox, they have the answer. And I think it's true until today for many secularists. And the other is that religion also plays an instrumental role in drawing and maintaining balance. We need to decide about a Jewish state, who is Jewish, what is what 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 makes someone Jewish, about how do you make a calendar, how do you create symbols, and how do you make demands for territory. All this makes religion very handy. So secularists, despite the uh, the image the Labour Party holds, can never really let go of religion in the full sense of the word. So religion is instrumental for Zionism. Sorry? Yes, so this, this also came, yes. And this came, came also as a claim when, they, when, when the issue of military service was discussed and the author of Ben Gur, you know, we are the last remnants of Torah scholars. So spare us military service, we need to study Torah. So yes, the Holocaust narrative, I'm, I'm trying to run to the, to, the, to the present so I didn't, didn't go too much into history. So, my previous work was about secularization in Israel. It always raised an eyebrow. Here, what are you talking about? There is no secularization. And I claim uh, that there is, but let me begin with a paradox. I mean, why people tend to ignore it. So first, that's the, the fact that Israel still does not have church-state separation. So it's still a state, one of the only Western states, which religion has a major stake in everyday life. Not only religion, it's orthodox monopoly. So it's religion of a very certain kind. So marriage, divorce is conducted by orthodox rules. Um, Israelis, when you survey them, have a religious attachment. So Israelis of all kinds have some attachment to religion. They perform rituals, they celebrate holidays. So 
Israelis who define themselves as seculars are quite minor. Now, we have a very strong religious presence in politics. We have religious parties who are part of coalitions, who make demands, budgetary claims, etc. So we have religion in politics in a very, very salient way. Uh, and, of course, uh, religious pluralism is very limited. So when we talk about Jewish pluralism, non-Orthodox Judaism is on the sidelines. It's not, not recognized, not funded, etc., etc., etc. So all this tells us that there is no secularization in Israel, but I claim there is. Now, so to do this, I have to go back to the sociology of religion, and again, uh, I'll try and try and, and, and keep. So when you look at Israel today, and I'm claiming that we see both trends, we see secularization and we see religious revival. And not only in Israel, there's an ongoing debate across the world about is religion declining, becoming stronger, or has anything changed? So this debate of, over a theoretical question of secularization versus revival of religion is a debate you can find in many countries. One of the problem is how do we measure this? So when sociologists try to measure are we becoming more or less religious, or is secularization happening? We're asking different questions. We're asking about identities. How do people define themselves? So are you religious, secular, traditional? We get from one to 10, how religious are you? That's one way of, self, of measuring self-identity. The other question is beliefs. Do you believe in God? So is the belief in God declining or rising in the past 20, 30, 40 years? A third question is about values. Do you hold liberal or traditional values? Do you support uh, abortions, pro-life, pro-choice, etc.? The fourth question is about practices. What do you do in your life? Do you observe the Shabbat? Do you keep kashrut? Problem is that when we measure all these things, they're not linear and they're not necessarily on the same level. People can believe, but not find of think of themselves as religious. People can identify as religious, but not practice several issues. People can be religious and liberal, secular and illiberal. So when we do these measures, uh, we get a very, very unclear answer. And often what we see in the newspapers are those highlights that want to stress some point that the reporter or the researcher wants to make. This was becoming more religious. Look, we have more people believe in God than we did last year. Um, what does that tell us? Well, I'm not sure that much. So how do we get out of this thing? And then you go back again to, 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 to the theoretical question. So in the 1950s, uh, sociology across the Western world was pretty much united in the thought that we're in the age of secularization. So if we look at religion in the 1950s, it's declining, it will decline, and it might disappear. And the example was modernization and science, et cetera, et cetera, and modern state. So the idea was, or the concept, the, the, the belief was, belief is a funny word here, that uh, in the not so long run, religion will decline, disappear, or become a private matter. This was kind of the uh, strong belief among sociologists. In the 1970s, this began to shatter. Because religion seemed not to go anywhere. It became, in some cases, stronger. And then came kind of the debunking of the theory. There's a famous article, secularization, rest in peace. Let's bury this theory. It's dead. We're not secularizing. Um, and then came attempts to try and rescue the theory maybe ask, maybe there's a more nuanced version of how we conceive secularization. And what I found convincing is the work by Mark Chavez and others, which look at secularization as declining religious authority. So what we're looking at is not, are people more or less believing, not more or less are people more or less belonging, but who do people obey in their everyday life? So the kind of religion might mean that people, in many instances, obey less religious authority. They might still define themselves as religious or believing. They might still go to church every Sunday. But in everyday life, when they make decisions, religion is not the authority to which they turn to. So with these economic decisions, 
or medical decisions or or uh, or uh, or family decisions, religion will not be the major or the or the factor in many instances. Now, this is useful for three for, for several reasons. First, again, when you look at practices, often you get many answers. What do people actually do? Second, uh, it's everyday life. So we tend to study religion and secularization either in ideological terms, people hold ideologies, in political terms. How do they translate this into, into political choices and parties? But we often miss out on everyday life. What do people do? And I think that's an important way to look at what's happening in Israel. And thirdly, and that's also important from my perspective, that secularization can happen without liberalization. And we think of this as a tangent. People who are religious are liberal. People who secularize become more liberal. But if you look at everyday life, which is at some times loosely attached to belief and belonging, then people can become less inclined to uh, obey religious, religious authority, but not become more liberal necessarily. And I think that's an important point. So this is my, my, my previous work, a uh, book that came out about, I think almost a decade ago. And what I tried to, to, to say is that, okay, so we have a value clash, which is religious secular, we have politics, but we also have everyday life. And I was arguing, uh, and I think it's still true to some extent, that in the 1980s, we began to see an Israel secularization. And uh, again, secularization in the terms that I mentioned above, the decline of religious authority. And I identified four drivers of secularization. What is ideology? So we still, we have people from early stages of statehood and before that believed in church-state separation. And this to some extent strengthened in the late 1980s, but not in a dramatic sense of the word, no, not in a dramatic sense. A second force is what I call non-Orthodox Judaism. So we have reformed Jews, conservative Jews, et cetera, et cetera. Again, uh, these people have interpretations of religion which are different than Orthodox. They demand recognition. Number-wise, they're not that great. They did get more support from the US, which made them a stronger presence in Israel. You think of the women of the wall, for example. I'll give an example of, of these trends. But there were two more important uh, effects. One was demographic, the Russian immigration. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, Israel received a large number of Russian immigrants who first, Many of them were not Jewish by uh, religious orthodoxy rules. That's like the, uh, the gap between the law of return and the definition of, of, of Judaism. To be brief, the law of return applies to people who are third generation. They have a Jewish grandfather or grandmother. That will allow them to immigrate to Israel. It will not make them Jewish though. Now, when this law was made in the 1970s, it was a very clever compromise. And under the thought that there'll be small numbers. So we had all these cases that brought to the Supreme Court. People in Israel, not recognized as Jewish, were asking the court for its help. This law would solve the problem. People can immigrate to Israel, can naturalize in Israel, but to become Jewish, you need to go through the process of conversion. There we go. I knew there's a relation to, 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 to the center. Um, so in the 1970s, this was the compromise based on the idea of small numbers. In the 1990s, we had a huge immigration of a billion people. Estimates about one third of them are not Jewish by Orthodox standards. And more than that, the vast number is secular in a very, very uh, obvious sense of the word. So if Israelis until the 1990s were eating pork, hiding under different names, uh, white meat, et cetera, the Russians came and they eat pork. There was no, for them, it was part of their culture, their diet. So this is a major change. We have a huge secular uh, uh, number of people coming in. And the fourth change is socioeconomic, globalization. So until the 1990s, Israel is a, a, a country which income is rather low in Western standards. Its exposure to world economy is limited. 
In the 1980s, 1990s, you have a big exposure to world uh, uh, goods, to consumption, which changes the way people act in their everyday life, the way they, 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 uh, they eat, the way they, they, they consume other things, which in many cases contradicts religious dictates. For example, Sabbath can be a good day for shopping if you have the income as part of your leisure. So this is the change that came out, and I think the last two changes are very much important to understand what happened in the 1990s. However, uh, this, of course, was did not happen in the void. There were, of course, counter forces of religious resurgence, whether it's national Zionism, whether it's ultra-Orthodox. They did not sit and wait for things to happen. They fought. And uh, they, so this, this, this fight actually created little challenges to religious pluralism. And uh, I can name a few. In the political scene, it was about how do we accommodate the needs and demands of the religious perspective. So now we have these very clear camps of people who are claiming we are religious or secular, and we have demands. And we expect the state, the society, to allow us to live the way we want to live. Um, another issue was reconnecting Israel with the Jewish diaspora. If Israel is becoming more and more orthodox and anti-pluralist, this has an effect on the relations with the U.S. Jewish community, and we can talk about this maybe later. Um, the demands for yeah, right, right. Right, we can come to that later, or, or I think I'll touch on that. Um, and so, as academics, uh, to, to deal with these issues, I think it, it brought us several debates that we try to engage with people in research. One was uh, public policy question. So now we have those issues on the table. How do you regulate marriage in Israel when you have such a large number of non-Jews who are ineligible to marry in Israel? That's a policy question. Um, how do you allocate resources when you have so many demands on the table? Uh, and again, how do you measure all these things? So we see these trends coming from different places. We have desculturization, we have Hadata, a new topic that comes in, in the 2000s. How do we know what's going on? And one of the concepts that, that came up was that we are in a culture war. So this topic became more and more uh, used by many Israelis. Um, and what underscored this was the feeling that the agreements, status quo mentioned earlier, are falling apart. That those agreements upon how do we conduct religion in public life and those compromises established in the, in the 1940s are falling apart. And uh, again, it comes back to the question, if Israel is a Jewish state, what is a Jewish state? And you can translate this into, into several questions. First, what is the role of religion in politics? In a Jewish state, how much do we need to have religion in politics? Uh, second, freedoms, personal freedoms. This is a Jewish state. Do we allow people to marry according to their will, their design? Uh, do we allow gay couples to marry? Uh, how do we conduct the force, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, rights of religious people. We agreed upon, for example, exemption of military service for the Orthodox. Can we still hold that exemption? Uh, we agreed that Orthodoxy will have an independent school system. Is the price too high? These are questions that come as part of this culture war, which I think all come to the question, what is a Jewish state? And I would say that for many years, uh, many of these conflicts were resolved by what we call informal politics. So we never agreed upon these things, but we agreed not to deal with them in different ways. So, and this could be done by different measures. One was to uh, move things from the national to the local. 
So for example, public transportation, in Haifa, yes, in Tel Aviv, no. Historically, that was how it made. Um, we could let the court decide things in the years of the state. So the court makes decisions based on personal cases, not major statements, and that can resolve things for the time being. Or we can simply not decide. That's another way to go along. Or what we call in Israel, form a committee, which is a way of non-decision in many cases. Um, and also what happened in when I wrote my book was that many of these issues actually shifted the market or to privatize decisions. So people who don't wish to be married by the orthodoxy could marry in Cyprus or could make a contract in the lawyer's office. So you could avoid the rabbinate simply by going around, not directly clashing with it. Um, if you had a problem with burial, there were private cemeteries who would care to your needs. So the markets and informal politics or private solution kind of shifted the, uh, the fight from the political level to beneath the political level, which allowed informal compromises, which allowed us to go along without actually having a choice. And maybe now we are in a stage where this no longer works. And the 2022 election, which I began with, uh, may signal the change we are in now. So here's a shift from my previous work to my current work and thoughts, and, and maybe we can, we, can, we can discuss this here. So the 2022 government uh, was a unique government. And uh, working with Danny Firk, we call this the era of populism. That's Danny's expertise, so I'm kind of piggy banking on, on Danny's thoughts here as well. So we have a government here which is based on, on kind of three, three parts, three or four parts. What is the Likud, which is a populist party, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the ultra orthodox, and the uh, religious right, or the extreme religious right. And this government, uh, from the get go, talked about changing completely the situation. And of course, the main target was the Supreme Court. And against this government, we saw rising protests. People who were fearing that we are heading into an authoritarian slide, to religious incursion on public and private life, and a threat of autocracy and theocracy. So if you read what people were saying on the street on demonstrations, these were the fears that drove them to the streets. And uh, I'll talk about this in a second. And so we have here maybe now a more clear setting for a culture war of a right-wing religious government against a protest that described itself as defy defending Israel to go to democracy. So liberal democracy is on the table. We have two camps, and this is a very fast sound way to describe it, but for the moment it's okay, in which we have a right-wing government and an anti-government pro-democratic liberal position. Um, so let me say a few words about populism. So populism uh, has many definitions, so I'll just pick up on a few and we can talk about this also maybe later. So populists view society as made of uh, two antagonistic groups, the pure people, the true people, and the elites or the corrupt elites or the disloyal elites, you can put the words in for elites. And democracy for populists is perceived as the expression of populist sovereignty. Democracy is about the will of the majority. So when liberals talk about individual rights, group rights, no, it's mainly about the, uh, the, the, the pop, popular sovereignty. Now, religion comes in because people is often what's called an empty signified. Who are the people? How do you define the people? Religion comes handy in a way to define the people, the pure people, versus the secular elites, which are also disloyal, liberal, etc., etc., etc. So religion can perform this role in ideology and strategy in separating people from the elites, the pure people, the believers, 
who have a warm heart and the elites who are liberal, global, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's about inclusion exclusion, about, sorry? They're not war, yes. Uh, not war in the sense that, that, that they care about they care about the universe and not about the people next to them. That, 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 that will be kind of the, uh, the metaphor of, of the populism. We care about the people, we come from the people, the elites are detached, they're global, they are in it for, for, for the money. Uh, and so religious uh, can, can, can be used to, to, to fill in the boundaries between us and them, in, in two senses of the word. First, us, who are part of our religion, and who are not, so Jews and non-Jews, but also within the religion, the good Jews and the not so good Jews. So religion comes in as a way to, to, to define the boundaries. And uh, again, it comes in handy because going back to what we talked about before, religion remained a significant force in politics. So contrary to secularism theory, which thought about religion disappearing, religion remained a force. Even in a secularizing world, which people shop on the Shabbat or live without marriage, Religion still performs a role in many instances of their life. So it doesn't disappear, it's still important. Um, but here are the contradictions that we also need to pay attention to. So religion can be used in different ways by copies. For some, it can be instrumental. Hey, we use religion to delineate the boundaries, Jewish and non Jewish. That's it. But for others, religion is the real thing. It also requires us to obey religious laws. So populists can use this word, this, this in different terms, which might create between them some tensions. Um, so some populist leaders might define themselves as religious. We are religious, and religion is what should set the tone. Others say, no, we are traditional. Religion is what defines us, but it doesn't, we don't obey to. To, to, to obey, we, we don't need to obey religious dictates. Um, so here's the difference. Is religion a way to delineate boundaries or also about what happens within those boundaries? That's one difference. So looking at Israeli populism, uh, we can look at two versions. So think of the Likud. The Likud rose out of the populist party, which from the get-go, identified with the people. If you go back to begging, it was the labor elite, and we the Likud are with the people of the periphery. Uh, but Begin was also liberal. So while he was very uh, traditional in the Jewish sense of the world, he was not anti-Arab. As you may know, he was also supported the annulment of the, uh, of the military rule over the Arab cities in the region. So Begin was a liberal, it was populism that we could define as inclusive populism, which means that it's populism used by the non-elites to demand a place at the table. So populism can be a democratic form of inclusion. Populism can serve as a way of peripheral groups to demand a place at the table against the elites who withheld, withhold their, 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 their presence. Uh, it's also the exclusionary which populism is about us and them. It's about we, the people, against the non-people, foreign, foreign laborers, Arab citizens, et cetera, et cetera. Under Netanyahu, the Likud transformed into the exclusionary populist party. So if you look at the history of the Likud, from Begin's liberalism to Netanyahu's gradual involvement, it became a populist party, but not only inclusion, but as an exclusionary populist party. So religion, in this party functions as a way of establishing boundaries between us and them in two ways. First, Jews and non-Jews. This is the Jewish state. Non-Jews have no place here. If we talk about uh, foreign laborers or asylum seekers, the Likud has a very strong stance on the need to remove them from Israel. Arab citizens, again, in Begin's time, it was less of an issue. Netanyahu, do you remember the, the famous saying, they are hurting, according to the polls, the Arabs are a danger. So they could present Arab citizens as a danger. However, they could, in terms of the in-group, is quite liberal. So they could can have Amir Ohana as a chair of the Knesset, 
always openly gay. So it's anti-liberal vis-a-vis the non-Jews. In the in-group, it can be quite liberal. So when the ultra-Orthodox parties are suggesting measures which would restrict women's equality or even gay rights, the Likud, many of its members, would not support that. So that's one kind of, uh, of issue within the populist parties. I don't think so. Okay, yeah. Agree, but I think that it could, there, there was always a, a, a gay, uh, a gay, a gay uh, how do you say, ta? Uh, there was always a section in the Likud of, of so the Likud, many of the Likud, many of the Likud, there were Likud members, prominent ones, who for years supported gay rights. So that's, it is sort of liberalism in, in, for the in group. And that's all it is. But again, if you compare this to Shas, for example, you see the difference. So Shas is, a, is an ultra orthodox religious, religious party, then the Sephardic Jews, who is built upon three oppositions, the Shas, the Shas position. It's the Sephardic Jews, the religious versus the secular Jews. It's Mizrahim versus Ashkenazim, and Jews versus non-Jews. So in contrast to the Likud's position, in which uh, there could be some liberalism toward the in-group, we talk about women equality or gay rights, Shas has a much more profound anti-liberal position in which religion is in several part of the public sphere. So, yes, yes, yes. I, I did. I did not say they're feminists. No, no. I, 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 I did not go that far. I think I think you're right, but 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 yeah, I, I don't think I'll be a good spokesperson for the Likud, but I would say that that in terms of of perception towards women equality and gay rights, the Likud and Shas there is a difference between them. You're saying it's not that great, maybe, but there is at least on the table a difference. But again, they're in the same coalition, so apparently they would sell these things for politics. Could be, could be. Uh, I'm just about to end, so we can open that in a minute. In a, in a minute, in a minute, minute question. So the twenty, the, the 2022 elections uh, again were about uh, major changes, and the Supreme Court was the main target, and for several reasons. For the Likud, the legislation, what we call the uh, judicial overhaul or reform, and you can choose the term you like here. For the Likud, the package represented the populist idea of democracy, the rule of the people. The Supreme Court stands in the way of the rule of the people. Therefore, we need to limit the role of the court in everyday politics. And you can add to that, the also personal issue that held legal affairs. That could also be part of the Likud's support of, 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 of the legislation. Um, for the religious, for the religious right, the Yudit, what we call fascism, uh, it's about uh, limiting the power of everybody who's not Jewish or is not Jewish and loyal. And for the ultra, the ultra Orthodox, have an old score to settle with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, its liberal position, has always turned in their way of uh, funding, of legislation, and for them, limiting the Supreme Court power was historically a mission. Yeah. 
Yes. It's all it's it's all it's all about pause. Okay, I'm 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 just about to finish, so we can open that in, in a minute for questions. Five minutes and then I'm done here. So um are we heading towards a culture war? Uh because we seem to be to be to be seeing here kind of two uh camps opposing each other, clashing in the streets. And I think there 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 is some there is some uh caveats which we need to consider. First, if you look, if you look at the coalition, while unity is very strong there, there are some differences that at some point might split the coalition. For example, the question of military service. While the ultra-orthodox demand that the, uh, the exemption continues, this might not stand well with the other parties of the coalition, especially when it comes to issues of drafting more people to the military, and if you go to their pipe dreams of the Bush Khatib, et cetera, you might need more soldiers. So the Orthodox might have to contribute their own part. Um, the anti-LGBTQ gender equality issues, I won't raise my hopes there, but there are differences within the coalition about what should be done and how. So that's within the coalition. But I think also, we also need to look at the opposition. Um, the opposition has... Uh, demonstrated a rise of a secular center left. But going back to my previous work, I think that Israeli secularism is very limited in its scope, in the sense that it's still very, very national at the core, and it still relies on the Jewish state. And in many cases, when it's about, when it's about uh, rights of non-Jews, it tends to mumble, so full rights of Arab citizens. So the secular left, or the center secular left, whatever you want to call it, in terms of commitment to liberalism, is liberalism with a small L. So what the coalition, on the one hand, has its own uh, um, weaknesses. I think the opposition, uh, the day after, will also have its own issues that have to deal with. To summarize this, looking on the road ahead, I think that populism and, and the right-wing coalition uh, might have gone too far, too ahead, too far and too fast. Uh, I always say when I talk about the people that, that are part of the opposition, that we were lucky that the government has put on the table everything on the first day. Rather than going in incremental fashion of making changes, everything goes on the table on the first day. Here's our vision of the future, which, uh, recording or not, it scared the shit out of many people and drove them to the streets. So maybe the 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 up the, the coalition plan was uh, looking strategically was a mistake. It's what brought an opposition. Um, and the question is uh, where the moderates and liberals stand in this future story of of populism. Um, second, and I think we're seeing that these days is Israel and the world. So this government, with its plans in all directions, might put in a clash with the world at large. Now, if you recall that the Likud is also a new liberal party that does have an issue with globalization and market economics, uh, the issue of world clash might be problematic for other for, for some of its aims. So for the government, the coalition, this plan put on the table, this populism that came in a very, very strong fashion has brought an opposition. Uh, the opposition, I think, discovered the power of civil society. I think for many liberals, for many left-leaning, center, whatever liberals, uh, the idea that they can be a group, a power, a society, uh, was something that they haven't dreamed of. And I think the long year protest has shown this group that it's here to fight, and in a position to the image of this group as detached, as global, as migrating, et cetera, this group has shown determinacy to stay and to fight. So I think that went also against some of the vision of, of the opposition to this group. Um, and what, this brought, what brought this to the fore, I think, was the politics of threat. I think those, the fact that the populist religious government has put on the table a vision 
that was so scary has created the opposition and the commitment to fight. And then lies the question, which I said a minute ago, how liberal and inclusive is this opposition? Can it, for example, accommodate Arab citizens? Can it accommodate non-Jews? Or is it simply a center-left Jewish opposition wishing for a liberal state that will cater mostly for Jews? And I'll end here. Thank you. Well, I think we look at the image from two nights ago in Jerusalem. I think we are kind of uh, redrawing the boundaries. Mm -hmm. If we were in the illusion that, you know, well, well, now we're all brothers and, you know, the world united us, I think the day after the war brings us back to square one, or maybe a different square, but, but, but the same idea. What image of a state are we looking for? So I don't think that the war is going to change things. And I think it takes time. I think there, there are, you know, it's, it's, it's an equation with too many variables to be able yeah. to, to, to say, but I think there's the international variable play a large part here. And my other, I'm an international relations specialist, and my others. So I think the, the Israel, is, Israel is proving to be very dependent upon the U.S. And there's a U.S. strategy for the Middle East, which Israel might have to conform to, which will cause, of course, a split within the government. There is the Netanyahu's personal affairs, which preventing for putting a plan for the day after that might dissolve the coalition. And as Effie said, we have two very different visions of the future states uh, and, and, its, and its borders, by the way. So I think the October 7th uh, have not changed the major questions here. I think for me, the major development is the everyday life. Mm -hmm. People often do these things without reflecting upon why they do them. And it has a major effect. Mm -hmm. So think of people that, think of the issue of marriage and divorce. So we talk about family values, but the divorce rate is skyrocketing. People are living as couples without being married. And when you ask these people, what are you? They would say, well, I'm traditional. Of course, I'm Jewish. Uh, I would observe Yom Kippur. So this is where the populism comes into it, in, into a clash within itself. So while Jewishness is important, it's a Jewish state, and we need to define the boundaries, how do we do that in the everyday life? And how do we define the, not, not just the form, but the content becomes much more difficult. So can you today enforce rules on homosexual behavior? Obviously you can. And if you look, you look at the last war um, and you see popular press talking about gay couples in the war. So I think things are happening in everyday life that are making changes that religion doesn't have an answer for. And so some people, of course, are, of course, so some people are reflective. You know, I find my own authority. I think many don't even reflect on what authority. I simply do things the way I believe or the way that I feel. People who shop on Shabbat, it's an ideological matter. It's because it's comfort or it's leisure. But you can't, somehow you can't reverse. I mean, you can always do these things. You can always, you can always reverse. But it seems that there is a secularization on everyday life that religion, as part of its research, has a hard time in containing. Mm -hmm. So I think among the ultra-orthodoxy and uh, going back to populism, there's a very strong shift towards the right wing. And you saw Goldknopf in the, uh, in, on, 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 which is kind of ironic, you know, uh, since the fact that he's going to serve in the military. Yeah. <laughs> and, So we have we have the actually we have actually two trends. One among the orthodox orthodoxy is the uh, the fact that the uh, the authorities are no longer there. Not the Rav Shach, not the Abu Bati, not even in their league is there. We have a young cohort who is becoming more right or anti Arab actually, a very Arab hater. And how do you how do you manage? So populism is very good for them. So it's anti Arab. It kind of drives us together. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a very it's a very concerning trend if you look at it from from my perspective. Thank you.
segregation from parts of the society. So uh, from parts of functions, as again, if is the ultra orthodox world now able to have some 40% of them in the army like they had in the 1948 in Jerusalem. <laughs> as when, when, when we have 40% of the male persons were defending Jerusalem. And could they think nowadays about the identity if so many would be part of Israeli civil life or military life? But okay, the civil is. Well, I, I must say, I'm not an expert on the ultra orthodox so I'm not, not, not an expert. These, I did have a chance to do research a few months ago, which will come out hopefully next month, on police and the ultra orthodox. So we had some focus groups with young ultra orthodox people. And I can tell you three kind of impressions that I had. First, they're very much a knowledge of Israeli politics. They read the paper, they know everything. These are the young people. Second, uh, they're very much anti-Arab and pro-Netanyahu. They believe Netanyahu is innocent, he's framed, etc. And third, they have no compunctions about not serving the military. I mean, they really think that they're doing the more important work. So they, they, they sat them in the room. We have had a group there, a focus group, about 15, 16 uh, young people, I think they were in their 19, 20 years old in yeshiva. And at some point, the, 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 the discussion turned into the, uh, the left-wing liberals who were selling out the state, which is me. Mm -hmm. And from all the 20 people in the room, only one person served in the military, that's me. But still for them, I was the not the disloyal elite. So I think there's a there's a split in, in terms of, of the, the way they think, but from their perspective, they're Zionists all the way. All the way. Um, one of them, I'm not sure if you if you can write, I I can't say this in English. One of them told me, an older man who's from the Pelegi Ushami, the the uh, mm -hmm. he, he said something like so being uh, a magist, a machine gun in, in, in Golani. What's the big deal? You do it for three years, then it's over. We study Torah for every day of our life. So from their position, oh, <laughs> uh, I assume so, yes. But, and, and being a, a, in Golani is quite difficult. <laughs> yeah. 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 not going to be willing to accept it any longer because it seems like the beginning of the war there was some um, unhappiness about it where which in in the general israeli society oh, I, absolutely I but i, I don't it. see it as a big issue now it it just is it's accepted somehow what's accepted the fact that they don't join the army i don't see a strong protest I think that again, if we go back to the to before October seventh, uh, and you look at the protest in the streets. I wrote somewhere that the ultra orthodox are the easiest target of the pro of, of 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 the protest. The fact that they align themselves with the right wing government, and so loyal to Netanyahu, they are the easiest target for the protest. I think. I don't. I don't think so. I mean, uh, at least what I heard in the protest was very rabid, anti Haredi uh, rhetoric. Block whether it decides to align differently with, with the different it's not, it's Of course, oh, but, 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 so, but, but, but so here's the culture war. I think this era may have ended because the ultra orthodox have now put themselves 
as right wing, not in the position of shifting. No. We are right wing. We belong to the right. That's what they've done for the, for the past four or five years. Now that might cost. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, I saw a poster in the elections of of the uh, Torah, Torah on your right. So they're making a, a clear statement, uh, and I think you know. I'm not sure because I think again the young people there's a very strong anti-Arab, anti-liberal turn, which everything is possible, but it'll be more difficult than, than before. If for many years the Orthodox have said on issues of uh, territories and security, we have no say. That's Khiloni business. Uh, now they're, they have an opinion, and they're saying it loud, loud and clear. Can they shift? Maybe. But I think, again, if you're looking for hope, uh, this right-wing religious coalition might drive away some moderates from the Likud. Who this vision of a religious fundamentalist state might be less appealing to them. Well, I'm talking about the people, not, not the politicians. Um, look, remember the last elections, Netanyahu won by about thirty thousand votes. It's not if the next elections these people will simply stay at home and not vote, they might turn the elections around. So I'm, I'm, I'm I've been a, sorry. The election. election, yes, uh, I I can solve that for you. Oh, we haven't defined. Oh, I should, I should, should, should define that better. Yeah. A culture war is when two opposing sides have completely different world views and they can't cross the lines. So if normal politics is about, we have different opinions, we share some ideas, let's put on other, the United shift coalitions. So on one issue, me and you might cooperate against him because that's an issue. Next day, I might shift. Culture wars mean that we are now on two split camps and we don't cross sides. And we decide everything according to the camp we are in. So if I am religious, I am right wing, I am anti-liberal, I'm anti-Supreme Court. I am hawkish on my political decisions. That's my camp. From the other camp, I'm uh, pro-compromise. I'm liberal. These are two camps that kind of split apart. And there's no middle ground. That's a cultural war. Now, is that is that a true vision? I don't know. But I think if you, if, if you look at, 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 the, at, the, uh, at the rhetoric and the way that politics is being built up in the past decades, there is some, uh, I'd say, glimpses that this is what we're heading towards. Yeah. How to feel? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think it's quite clear. I think it's quite clear. If you look, yes, but Shas might cross the lines. I'm not. I'm not sure how much. I'm not sure how much. See the entrepreneur. If you go on Motsay Shabbat to uh, the demonstration in Tel Aviv, it's totally safe. There's no, there's, there's, there's no kippot. Yerushalayim is a uh, Yerushalayim has this 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 this, this group of of. of...
ועדיין נראה לי שאני חושב שהשיח הציבורי כאן סביב נושא החטופים מאוד ברור מי בעד מי נגד. אני לא בטוח שאין בטוח. But that, I, I, did, I did have some caveats there. I said, well, for a culture war, you need to have two camps which are unified. So I said the one camp has within the differences regarding questions of LGBTQ rights and women's rights. So not unified. The other camp might be not so liberal. So that, that these are the caveats of why we are not having this. But again, uh, a middle, a center, which is more moderate, does not rule out the possibility that two camps will conduct the culture war. Or, uh, that was Rob Sowick, who was a student here in this university, and received his PhD from this university, in my department, um, posted a post on Facebook. And he said, The truth must, must be told. The campaign for the abattis is diminishing Israel's power and empowering Hamas. That's how it begins. This is, what it, this is how it begins. And when he runs through the argumentation, he basically says the people who are advocating for the abductees are advocating for individualism and the prominence of individualism over the national issues, over the national issues. And the true leader should look aside from the individual tragedy of the abductees, look at the greater national picture and come to the right national decision based on true identity markers. That's that's the run of the mill. Okay. And I you would flip. You would flip. Of course. Of course. But still there's a there's I think that there's a huge divide between coming forward, saying this out loud, and of course he can do it because he's a bereaved father, right? His son was killed in a terror attack. He has protection and he has the aura of that he can say. They were left with losers. Because they lost, because they lost. Those. Uh, those that were, were, were dividing between the, the people that have to say you have to go on for the national interest, we have to, to continue the war, and if you lost family members into a hostage situation, so you are a loser. But forgetting that some of the persons that were, ta were, that were taken came from background, from the area around, and not only from the so-called kibbutzim, and the leftist uh, settlements uh, around the Gaza Strip, but they came from uh, uh, cities with uh, Oriental Likud-based uh, background, and there where they became suddenly losers. Yes, and only the winners that uh, take on. Okay, I'm okay. 
the 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 argument is beyond if you if you're looking beyond your personal aspects like your family like like what your own experience and you look on for the eternity of the people of israel and the eternity and so on and so on i think you, and, can, you can frame this in, in, in liberal ways i mean does the state owe its citizens and need to release them or is this obliged to the state i think that that's a different okay. issue Just to <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely, but I think that what I'm trying to argue here is that religion in this war is what defines the boundaries. So even even in the in the camp of the government, even those who are not religious in their everyday life behavior. Religion is instrumental for them to describe the others as either not belonging or belonging and disloyal. If, if you think, uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting speech by Galit Distal Baryan. Um, no, but, 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 but I think if you, if you read, it says there was a speech after this, this soldier was released from, 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 the, from, from the hostages, Ori Megidish. She talks about her mother. How Ori Megidish's oh, mother has been praying and doing all these ceremonies, and uh, and she was like, maybe I'm not doing these things, but I've respected. The other part sees them as ridiculous, as pagan, as primitive, but we really have respect for these things. You know, the way you're split things. I don't know, I don't have to do this, but I can say I respect them, and, and you're the elites. You tend to disregard those things as primitive, as pagan. That's what separates us. We really could, we respect tradition. We don't have to obey the rules, but you have to respect them. I think it's a very important difference. Yes, of course. Of course. I agree. But, 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 but that, now it's become a war. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I, th I think that it, it, it's is absolutely. In other words, this thought of demonstration of the state which is something to bring about the whole democracy with the goal with the to a point where you think this will spill over into 
vigilante violence. Um, I'm especially concerned with the mass distribution of sidearms and firearms during the war. Um, I think from October 8th, Ben Clear was very busy with trying to uh, create rabble among everyone, warning of uh, the potential of, you know, of the internal Arab uh, uh, warfare. So I think there, there is, there are people that violence for them is actually uh, instrumental or even ideological. So when you talk about, when you talk about the, uh, the confluence of religion and, and politics and extreme, extreme right-wing politics, I mean, violence is, you know, that's something you'll be surprised of, of seeing. I mean, Benghazi, you know, is, you know the history. I mean, all the history of the supporters. So I think the violence is, is absolutely a possibility. And uh, so we can talk about, about, about the, the distribution, distribution of, 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 of weapons. It's a different topic, but think of the, uh, how neoliberalism here meets uh, right-wing politics. So we, we privatize security and we distribute guns and here's what we get. So there are many different crossroads here, which we need to think of in a more profound way. You know, on this optimistic note. Arabic minority nowadays is how big? 20% of the Israel population. They have absolutely no role in the wars to come. In the culture war? For example. I think I didn't mention them. I think their absence, what I mentioned, I think that the liberal camp, the main question to me is can the Arab be part of this camp? I mean, does the liberal camp resort to Jewishness in a more liberal way, which is only towards Jews? Is willing to step another step and talk about rights of non-Jews in the so-called Jewish state. That's what that's... And yes. Yes. Important subject. What about the Arabic minority? Minority. They not be considered a small minority in any other no. country. Agreed. What about? They are proactive role in all this mess, if any. Well, one must not you know, to delve into topics he's not an expert on. Uh, I do think that uh, the way that minorities make choices and act is often dependent upon the structure in which they're within. So I think the Jewish state at the moment offers very limited options to the Arab minority. And that's why I go back to what I said before. Mm -hmm. uh, are center left liberals willing to include Arabs and begin this process? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm asking, 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 I
or not function, but essence of religion, as opposed to religion as some kind of individual, like what mm -hmm. Max Weber called uh, religious virtuoso, which is a later development of a religion which was originally a group about a group identity and setting the boundaries as for them. So don't you think that we are in that sense kind of back to more, not secularization, but back to more kind of archaic uh, situation when religion again is at the, how to say, center of our identities and which determines us versus them. And so this is not secularization, but back to very, very archaic functions of religion. I agree, and I think that's more or less what I try to say, that religion is still very functional in terms of defining the us and them. So that's why, so that, that's why it never went away, because eventually people turn back to religion to say who we are. That's about the, the, the form. That's about the us and them. But about who is the us, that's where we can secularization. So I can think of myself as Jewish, as not Muslim, not Arab, as committed to a Jewish community or whatever. But when it comes to obeying religious religious laws, it may or may not obey them. That, that's, I think, where the split is. And that's when you talk about religious, religious authority, it gives kind of kind of a, a more uh, nuanced uh, way of thinking about it. It's not just about uh, how you define yourself, but also what you do. And that's where we, we find these inconsistencies. So yes, I'm Jewish. Yes, I vote for, for a Jewish party. Uh, yes, I, 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 I fast on Yom Kippur. And yes, I think the Arabs are my enemies. Uh, when it comes to uh, Having uh, gay friends, I'm fine with them because we are my friends, and I really agree they should have a right to marry. So that 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 that's the I think what's happening is that we're we're, we're seeing more inconsistency over the world. However, under a cultural war, they might diminish. So what matters now is the us and them. And that, that 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 that's where we're trying to play. With. We can't really take it out. We can remember. And what the scientists know. Spirituality is uh... a. <laughs> okay. There is a need. I agree, but what I was focusing, but what I was focusing on is when does it become important politically? Because if it's if it's only spiritual, it might be non-political. Okay, so I, I I can pray and I and I can but but my concern is when does these things translate into a political agenda, political identity? So I, I don't I don't disregard spirituality, but for me it becomes interesting as a researcher when it meets the political arena. Mm -hmm. 